and these workers think they're entitled to a government bailout, to, to taxpayer dollars. And, and we've really become an, a, a nation of industries that have become looters, where they just feel free to pick the pockets of the taxpayers every time they get in trouble. We're on the high, one thing he is right about, because of dumb government policies, the federal taxpayer is on the hook for about $50 billion of the pensions through the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. It's not the taxpayer. So, you know, we're no, screwed either way. No one's raising taxes. The government is either borrowing this money or printing it. So it's the people who are foolish enough to buy the government bonds who are going to suffer. Or, or, or American citizens who have savings. You know, and, 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 but, uh, guys, I, I will say this. We have been sitting here talking about that. It's about to, we're going to get another trillion, multi-trillion dollars confiscation of wealth bill coming down the pipe when the economy gets worse, because, partly because of this one, I've been saying that we have to actually preempt their preemptivity. So how about this, guys? Everybody go march on your local town hall April Fool's Day and just get a little bit of local coverage on it and speak up against this stuff. There is a tide out there rising up against this. We see the tipping point here. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, you know, I was watching uh, uh, Bernanke today was making a speech, and he was assuring us that there's absolutely no sign of inflation, that he's not worried about all the money that he's printing. There's not going to be any inflation. And, he, and he, you know, this is, the same, guy. Well, this is the same guy who told us that the housing market was sound, that subprime was contained, that the fundamentals of the economy were sound. He has been wrong on everything he's ever said. Now he comes out and assures us be in that there's years. no inflation. What he's doing right now, how bad are those policies going to impact us? Five years from today. Oh, it's right. let me it's tell not going to take that long. It's let, a disaster. Let me tell you what my greatest uh, fear five years from now, and I'd like Lou Rockwell to weigh in on this. And, and if there's any word worse than the S word for socialism, it's the N word for nationalization. And before you joined us, Lou, and I, uh, I think you're in California today, uh, we recounted that two Republicans, not known for their devotion to the free market, but not wild-eyed liberals, John McCain and uh, Lindsey Graham have said that, quote, nationalization must be on the table. What the heck are they talking about? If the government can't run the post office, can't run Am Amtrak, can't keep a public washroom clean, <laughs> do they really think they can nationalize banks like in Sweden? Well, no, but they can loot. They know how to loot, and that's what this is about. It's about looting the average guy for the benefit of the bank. And I noticed that Alan Greenspan is quoted in the, in the Financial Times today as totally endorsing nationalization of the banks. And they hilariously refer to him as this high priest of laissez-faire. Well, of course, Alan, maybe he was a laissez-faire guy back when he was associated with Ayn Rand, but he's no laissez-faire guy now. He's a big government man. That's the worst part. But he's, of, of all the people who brought on this disaster, he bears the most responsibility. And now he's advocating... A Soviet-style measure. It's, uh, I must say, astounding. See, these free market, they are, are these socialists slash communists like Alan Greenspan and basically most of the Republicans in power pretend that they actually aren't that, and they claim the title of free market when it's convenient, and, and they give free markets a bad name. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, in fact, now he's even trying to say Greenspan is trying to say that he was wrong in putting his faith in the free market. Right. What he was wrong oh. was in in his manipulation of the money supply. He should have put in his the faith in the free market. And, yeah, and he should have kept interest rates high Steve, and not bailed everybody Steve out. Steve Moore, my uh, colleague at the Fox News Channel, uh, Charles Krauthammer, also the syndicated columnist out of the Washington Post, opined yesterday, and I don't know where he got the figures from, but let's assume that they're accurate for the sake of this argument, that we are approaching the point where one-third of gross domestic product at some point passes yeah. through the hands of the government. Is there some point north of one third where we will officially be a socialist country? Well, you know, the well, he got those numbers. He got those numbers from me because I was the one who put them together. You know, uh, just to give you a context on this, throughout the uh, post World War II period, about twenty percent of federal gross uh, domestic product went to the federal government. Uh, this past year it was 25 percent, and this year it will be about 33 percent. When you add state and local government spending, that brings us to about 40 percent. And to put that in context, Germany and France and Sweden are closer to 50 percent. So we're 80 percent of the way there towards a kind of socialistic uh, uh, European-style socialism. Add in some of the guarantees. I mean, you know, when we start looking at the guarantees on Fannie, Freddie, five trillion dollars of debt, and another trillion at the banks outside of TARP, how do you account for that total? And then are we talking? I actually wrote the other day on uh, FoxBusiness.com and on MarketWatch.com that we're over seventy percent of GDP when you start including all of that. 
Well, if you you're right. If you inc if you include all of those uh, guarantees, and, and I calculate about 16 trillion dollars of debt and mortgages and pensions and things like that are now guaranteed payment by the federal government. So you know you're exactly right. It's it's probably close to over 100 percent of GDP when you take into account all of the guarantees and insurance. They're well, guaranteeing things they can never pay. I mean, one yeah. of the reasons that some of these Wall Street yeah. firms went broke is because they, they wrote credit default AIG. and now they can't pay. Well, the government is making the same mistake. Obviously, they can't possibly insure all the debt that they've insured. It's impossible. All they can do is destroy the money. Lou Rockwell, does anybody in the government understand this, or are we the only ones who worry about it? Well, the government understands what's good for the government. Yeah, they understand what they understand. They're ripping us off. Um, you know, all we and and uh, what Franz Pick said so many years ago about federal uh, treasuries being uh, certificates of guaranteed expropriation, that's about all we can expect from the federal government now, more expropriation. And one thing we can do besides fighting this already illogically, I'll just say, is buy gold. As long as you've got dollars and people will accept your dollars for gold, buy gold. All right, somebody writes, Nathan Cox writes, as grassroots are pushing Schiff to run for the Senate next year. Did you know that? Yes, I know that. All right, and the question is, will you? I, I don't know if they mean will me or if they mean will Cody <laughs> or Lou Rockwell no. or Steve Moore, but they do ask if we're interested in it. I'd probably be miserable there, Lou, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, not for me, but I'd be fun to have Peter do it. I'm flattered that they be great to have you there. That judge, but in all seriousness, Peter, I get that a lot from readers on SpokeUp.com, on my Facebook page, asking if there's a potential for a presidential ticket with you and Ron Paul in 2012, 2016. Look, I mean, I I mean, that would be a stretch, you know, to think that. I mean, that's, you know, I'm, I'm not a political guy. Uh, How, about not, I, How about Treasury? How Would you head up the Treasury if someone asked you to? Well, look, I, like, I, a lot of these departments people say, would you head the Federal Reserve? Well, I would just dismantle that's this. Exactly right. Would back you dismantle the Treasury? Too? But, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know if I'm going to run for Senate. I mean, it's not my intention to run for Senate. I know there are some people that are that are toying with the idea because He's God wants to make a politician. Uh, Sounds pretty Connecticut. good to me. <laughs> so, Tony, so it's, not my, it's not my intention to run for Tony right. from Indiana asks, does the stimulus violate the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution? Oh, my God. Let me count the yeah, ways. Well, everything that the, the government does. That, that is the government's, after the second, that is the government's least favorite amendment, to the federal government's least favorite amendment to the Constitution. Yeah. The use of the Commerce Clause is virtually eviscerated, yeah. whited out the Tenth Amendment yeah. from the Constitution. Yes. Can, I, can I take that one on, Judge? Yes, Steve. Because this is, this, is one of my, this is one of my pet peeves. I call them the forgotten Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which basically say that all powers that are not exclusively uh, and explicitly given to the federal government are resor reserved for the states and the people. And those would become the two amendments that the, that the Congress has thrown out the window. This stimulus bill basically makes states subservient to the federal government when it's supposed to be the opposite, that the, that the federal government is supposed to be a creation of the states. You said the following. The states created the federal government. The federal government didn't create the states. Ronald Reagan in his first I, I inaugural address. <laughs> it sounds like Jefferson, but it was as recent as Jefferson. Reagan. But you know, nobody follows that anymore except the people at this table. Well, and the people in the Republican Party say they do, and that's, again, part of the problem. They have embraced, and not that Reagan was a true yeah. embracer of private property, yeah. too. There were okay. And, and you know, the, the, the Constitution is a very short document. I mean, unlike the stimulus bill. <laughs> but, and, and, the, and the Article 1, I think it says in Section 8, that, 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 that grants... The, the few powers to the federal government is very small. Think about all the things the federal government does now. None of that stuff is authorized. Really? Let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me just, give, let me just give the uh, panel a couple of statistics, which uh, George Zooks, my producer, and our researchers at uh, what we call the Brain Room here, which is uh, the great researchers we have here, uh, have gotten for us. Thank you, since we, room, si thank you very much to the Brain Room. Since we were on last Wednesday, just seven days ago, four banks have failed to be taken over by the FDIC. Now, I've never heard of these. Pinnacle Bank in Beaverton, Oregon, Corn Belt Bank and Trust in Pittsfield, Illinois, Riverside Bank in Cape Coral, Florida, and Sherman County Bank in Loop City, Nebraska. The FDIC estimates that it has spent $329 million to bail out the depositors of this bank. Since we last met, Congressman John Tanner, Democrat of Tennessee, chairman of the House Delegation's NATO Parliamentary Committee, took his wife and 13 lawmakers.